welcome to Pop Cult X, episode 37, our penultimate for the year 2021, or should I say, the year of our Lord, 2021. You know, we'll harken back to the medieval times when they talk like that. But I'm your co-host, Daniel, and with me, joining me today is... Gabriel. He's as always. For a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, as... As you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm a little festive today. We're recording this in the middle of December, so a little bit in the holiday spirit, just, you know, trying to brighten the mood, I guess. I don't know. But yeah. I'm having some fun with it, and, and because some of the stuff in the news, I guess, and some hot topics can get a little more on the heavier side that we yeah. bring up. So I'm just, you know, trying to lighten it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Good speaking idea. of hot topics... What 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 has caught your eye this week, or what have you seen, or what's been like, like just you know, in your wheelhouse or in your yeah? U-box? Well, unfortunately, it kind of goes along with the not so happy Christmas stuff, okay. like kind of being on the the depressing side. Um, we went and saw West Side Story, and I, I've never seen the original, so this is like oh, the remake okay. version of it. Yeah, I obviously went into it knowing that it's like a retelling of Romeo and Juliet. So mm-hmm. obviously, like, that's going to tell me how it ends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> me not being, like, a big musical fan, like, I never was drawn to the original. But apparently there was a lot of, like, suspect, questionable things that were done in the original as far as, like, lyrics being kind of racist, putting Rita Moreno in blackface, obviously getting Natalie Wood to play a Puerto Rican when she was a white woman is like one of the biggest things so they steven spielberg directed this version and tried to correct some of those wrongs i guess um of the past by Mm -hmm. putting puerto ricans in roles where they're portraying puerto ricans and um rita moreno's in it as a like a new added character the music is slightly different they've changed up some of the lyrics i think for modern day you know uh, politically correctness i guess and um the is performance it still set in the 60s or 50s it is okay yeah so it's still you know sort of at that time when there was a large influx of puerto ricans um coming from puerto rico into the new york boroughs um and clashing with the children of you know irish immigrants um which is kind of interesting it's like an interesting time during america's history when like italians and irish Amer- like irish people immigrated to united states were heavily discriminated against and then then saw that other people were doing the same thing that they did and thought well it was really shitty for us to get discriminated against why don't we do it to someone else so then <laughs> they started discriminating against other people right but i think it's hilarious. like it's so american right like yeah oh I, I i didn't learn by what happened to me and maybe i should be a better person <laughs> no i'm just going to be a shittier person and do unto others what others. was done unto me <laughs> right yeah right um, and so The story is interesting. I'm still like not sold on the whole idea of like a Puerto Rican girl falling in love with like an American, you know, white American guy. And you've seen the original, right? Yes. Yeah. So her brother is killed by Mm -hmm. the guy that she's in love with. And I, to me, that was like a really hard pill to swallow that she would be like, oh, you just killed my brother, but I love you. (laughs) <laughs> like that's just so that's so weird. Yeah, like I don't I don't get that, especially within a Puerto Rican community, like Latinx or community. Families, family is so important. Yeah. I can't see that. I I can't see that a girl. Well, I, I it's just not believable. But other than that, the performance is really good. Um, particularly the uh, actress that plays Anita. She, and we're going to talk about Golden Globe nominees. I'm pretty sure she got nominated. I haven't looked at the nominees yet. Um, but I would assume that she got nominated for like best supporting actress. Um, her performance is amazing. I've actually seen her perform live for the Donna Summer musical. Um, I saw her perform that, that. Ariana DeBase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was nominated. Yeah, and she's she's incredible. She's Afro Latina, so I think it was kind of cool to have an actual Afro Latina instead of like Rita Moreno on blackface. Mm-hmm. Um, she part of the script that was amended does 
mention discrimination against people who are darker skinned or Afro Latino within the the Puerto Rican community. So I thought that mm-hmm. was kind of interesting. It, it does kind of fly under the radar though, because it's in Spanish, the comment that she makes to her boyfriend and there's no <laughs> subtitles in the movies. Right. So if you're American that. and you're don't speak Spanish that like, you're not going to get that. And so it is kind of interesting that they chose not to do subtitles. I picked it up, but the majority of the audience, I think, and who this film was made for is the white audience, and they're not going to know what's going on unless they speak Spanish. So um, outside of that, it was enjoyable. Like the performances are really good. Um, I think the one person who doesn't do like an amazing job is Ansel Elgort, mm-hmm. um, who I plays that, the yeah. lead. Um, mm-hmm. He's kind of controversial in in that role b- to begin with, because I think um, some people are boycotting the movie because he was accused of some wrongdoings. Um, yeah. And so they wanted him to be digitally removed from the film. The film has actually underperformed um, based off of what people projected it to, to do. Um, and some people are putting the blame on, on that, on the fact that people did not want to see him in a, a romance uh, movie or musical. And uh, I could see that. I, I think that audiences nowadays definitely speak with their dollars and, they don't like someone that's cast or, you know, if there's the lead has done something that's kind of bad, they're not going to go watch it like before in the past, like maybe they would overlook it. Um, and so that was a choice that they made. And so I guess maybe now they're not making as much money as they, they thought they could. So interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I, I heard about his controversy with him. I mean, I, I mm-hmm. liked his performance in Baby Driver and mm-hmm. that's the only one really that I know of him. Um but yeah, that's interesting that that people are speaking with their wallets for mm-hmm. for that role. Whereas like we talked about last week with like Mel Gibson and stuff, and hopefully that trend will continue yeah. and and it won't and people won't go watch anything that has him involved with. Yeah. So they're, you know, leaving the movie, it's obviously ends on like a sad note <laughs> because it's, it's like, you know, Romeo and Juliet, it's, it's like a love a story that does not end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a tragedy. So leaving that, I, th- I, you know, come home and, oh, it's the, the world premiere of, and just like that, the sex in the city, you know, <laughs> new reimagining uh-huh. or, or continuance of the story. So I'm like, that'll be good for a laugh, right? You know, you it, I, you know, it's it's sexy humor, <laughs> funny. Turn it on within the first, you know, couple minutes. One of the lead characters dies by a heart attack, so not necessarily the escape that I was looking for. <laughs> not a lot of laughs when it comes to seeing someone lose their husband by a heart attack. So that wasn't what I was expecting. Um, and it, it wasn't what Peloton was expecting either. I hear. Right. I think their yeah. stock took like a twenty percent dive because if. Well, I don't know if it's spoilers. I haven't seen it, but I know about this. Yeah. Is that so? The character of uh, Mr. Big is that it? Yeah, I guess has a heart attack after taking a a cycling class on a Peloton, right? Yeah, and then he has a heart attack and he dies. And the stock for the actual company in the real world now this is a made up storyline, so this mm-hmm. isn't real. And but it has real world effects in that that stock took a nosedive because. I guess people said, hey, we don't want that. That causes heart attacks. I yeah. mean, and even so much that Peloton had to release an ad stressing the benefits of cardiovascular exercise, which can be derived from riding a Peloton. It's crazy. I, Americans are so stupid. I swear <laughs> to God. How, how many people die of heart attacks? And and does McDonald's plummet? Does fast food close its <laughs> <Right>. doors? No, <laughs> but this. Oh, oh, that's my excuse for not exercising. Mister Big died while exercising. Like, come on, <laughs> Americans, really? <laughs> so the the other thing with the show is that obviously it's like fifteen years later since we've last seen these characters. They're obviously much older. Um, I would say they're probably like in their fifties to sixties, that range. Um, and Mm -hmm. so it's interesting. They definitely are like pushing them in like, these characters are old. Like one of the characters is like wearing hearing aids and I'm like, okay, I get it. They're older, but like, they're really pushing them. Like uh, not everyone in their fifties is like has hearing aids and like, one of the the Cynthia uh, Nixon, her character has like all white hair now, and and it just, I don't know. It's it's interesting because they're trying to update it, 
the thing that I, and I'm going to, you know, get on my soapbox again, but the thing that, that is interesting is that sex in the city had received some criticism for not being the most diverse show on HBO, right? Mm-hmm. Like for white women, you know, pretty much all their love interests with maybe like one or two exceptions were all white men. Um, they did have like a gay character. So I guess that's one thing, but Coming into this new storyline, they introduce some characters. One is Latina. She's Mexican and Irish, and she's also uh, non-binary. Um, they have an African-American um, friend of one of the other characters who's sort of like the rich African-American version of one of the characters. And then a, um African-American professor who teaches like diversity in, in university. And so there's sort of all these hijinks that kind of happen with the characters uh, involving themselves in the lives of these people of color. And I just think it's kind of interesting that, that the characters are having so much trouble, like particularly one character of like relating to this black woman and saying the wrong thing and being kind of like a bumbling idiot. And I think it's kind of interesting that people who may be live in a bubble in like a white bubble and want to be around people of color or want to introduce diversity within their community. It's like, just treat those people of color, like the way you would treat Right. Your friends, mm-hmm. like, right. why right. do you? Why is it like? Oh my god! Like, I can't say this. I can't do this. And uh, like, that's what makes it awkward and weird. Yeah. Is that <laughs> you're still viewing them as like some alien creature? Right. Like, that's true. We are just like you. So mm-hmm. like, you don't have to put on like this weird act. Like, just treat us like equals. Like the what what we act. Like we're not asking for you to like walk on eggshells and like. Oh, you use the wrong label. Like those kind of things don't really happen in real life. Like obviously this is for comedy and um, for dramatic sake, but there's there's like what one thing that happens is the the character comes into the classroom and the professor walks in and she's got like long um, braids in her hair Mm -hmm. and she's like, Oh, I'm the professor. And the the main, the sex in the city character is like, you're the professor, but your hair. And she's like, what about my hair? Like a a professor can have braids. And she's like, no, but in your picture you have short hair. And it's like sort of making fun of the fact that like, you know, this woman would be kind of, super sensitive to the fact that like a white woman is criticizing her hair. But in reality, like people of color are used to that so much that most mm-hmm. of the time we like blow it off. Like, and but it, what's funny is that these white writers and white actors are portraying it. Like it's almost like they're the victims of the circumstance. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, it's so difficult walking into the situation and you can't see anything right. And, and God, like our hearts in the right place, but they make it so hard for us. And it's like, it's really not like if you just yeah. act like a normal person, like just exactly. chill out and like <laughs> stop being such a weirdo. I don't know. It's really weird. The whole, the first two episodes of it are like really awkward. Um, they handle the whole funeral of Mr. Big and it's super serious. But then like the gay character like starts making really weird, inappropriate comments about like people. And, and it's like, it makes him look weird and catty and kind of stereotypical and mm-hmm. and it's so like off putting because it's like in the funeral setting and it's just weird it it has really i think it they really <laughs> tried really hard to come into like modern day age or like try to have diversity but they still don't understand it cuz like i don't know if they didn't take the time to like really investigate those worlds i don't know it's weird it just i don't know it, it, yeah, I, obviously, like not as a fan, you don't know the characters as like probably as well as I do, having seen like every episode. And mm-hmm. it's hard to believe that like four sophisticated women that live in New York wouldn't know how to like interact with a diverse community. Yeah, because it's fucking yeah, New York. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. really? Like, and and I know that like there, you know, there are rich white people in New York that like live in a bubble, but like the characters were never really that. Like, they're supposed to be mm-hmm. like hip like you know going to parties and being like in the art scene and like they're gonna come across a diverse group like yeah i don't know so it's kind of weird uh it 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 wasn't what i was expecting um so hopefully the other episodes become 
more funny and more of an escape because it's it's really kind of a downer at this point. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Maybe you'll yeah. know. Why is it called And Just Like That? So the main character um, played by Sarah Jessica Parker is a writer, right? She writes a column mm-hmm. for Sex in the City. That's the name of her column. And right. so she's known for like making little quips. Like so every episode it's like – um, you know, oh, are couples really fighting nowadays? Like, is being single the new black or whatever? And then that's like the episode. That's the theme for the episode. And so that's sort of like the tagline. And and so it's like, and just like that, my husband died. I don't remember the exact line, but it's like that's basically okay. what what it what it's getting to is like, and just like that, like she's single again or she's all alone, and just like that you know, her world has shattered. And gotcha. uh, so it's kind of, it, it goes along with her character and like how she speaks. It's, it's within her voice. Uh, okay. But it, there's some other things that it's just like, even the characters don't seem like some of the events that happen don't seem true to the characters. Um, she's known for writing a sex column and like it being pretty graphic and, mm-hmm. and it detailing her and her friend's sex life. And then she, in, in the modern retelling of it, she's on a podcast with the Latina woman or Latina person, um, and an Asian man who sort of like represents like the, you know, cis male perspective and, okay. Sarah Jessica Parker is like the cis straight woman and, and they're talking to her and they're like talking about, I think they're talking about masturbation and they're like, so have you ever masturbated? And she's like, oh, I, I, I can't like, I can't talk about it. I'm like, this is a character whose her whole career has written about <laughs> sex and like in great detail talking about her breakups, her, you know, multiple mm-hmm. affairs and Mr. Big and all this stuff. And now she's shy about talking about masturbation. And it's like, really? Like, it doesn't seem, I don't, I don't know. It just seemed know. weird. I don't know the character well enough, but I could right. just say from personal experience, talking about something and writing down a communication form of it are two different for me, at least. I have, I feel like I'm much more, a better idea of how to express myself in a written word and able to talk about more subjects than I would being able to verbalize something. Now, I don't know if that's something that character has, yeah. um, but but that's just how I am. So I don't know if, if she's, I could see that. that I, mean, I know there's certain pop stars that are, that can perform and they're very suggestive. And like, I think of Janet Jackson being able to go out and like perform and dance, but like in real life, she is very shy. And so like, mm-hmm. maybe if she was like asked by a reporter to talk about sex, she would be kind of embarrassed by it. And then someone yeah. could be like, well, but you sing about that and you perform mm-hmm. these like really provocative things. So I get, I could see that, but Nothing about her character has ever said like (laughs) there's a duality of that, right? Like she wears like very provocative clothing. Like she she likes attention. She like she's known for like you really have to know the character. Like she struts down the street. Like that's like one of the themes of one episode. And um, and she's not like a young, a particularly young woman. But it just seems like it. The character, I don't know. Like maybe they forgot what their characters were like, or they want to take it down a different route, but it just seemed not true to the character. I don't know. So, so, but that was that, that was my first impression. What's that? I said 15 years really ages a person. Oh yeah. Yeah, it does. I guess. Obviously (laughs) like, yeah, according to sex in the city and just like that. So I'm hoping that it gets better because I am a fan of the show. Um, I, I do like it. There are, it was very problematic. The, the first iterance of it, because it was like, you know, they had like trans jokes and like I said, it wasn't very diverse and it like sort of some racist stuff in it. Um, and not so like blatantly, but like enough like microaggression or like little things that kind of don't age well. Um, mm-hmm. so I'm glad that they made the effort. But it's a little awkward the way they did it. So hopefully it gets better. Um, I, I mean, I think that it's only this like one series that they're going to do. I don't think they're going to do anything past that. So hopefully it gets better before it ends because I, I don't want them to go out on a high – I definitely want them to go out on a high note. That's cool. Yeah, I, I think about to like the – when Will and Grace did their reboot Yeah, and how like they retconned everything that happened at the, from the end of the very first run of it. And I think – um, if it's Did anything they, like really? that, yeah. So at the end of the original Will and Grace, um, 
I think they Will and Grace go their separate ways. They have their mm-hmm. kids, and they go out separately, right? But in this, in the reboot of it, it completely changes it. They have their kids together, and they're all living, I guess, happily ever after. I don't know, but oh, it's really? it's something like that. I have to watch it again. But I I did appreciate the the storytelling in the reboot of it. So hopefully, with your show, it will get better. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah, yeah well, I hope so. I hope we hope, you know, high hopes, right? Here we're going into a new year. Hopefully it it, it things start to go more positive. So um what have you been watching? I, I well I've been watching and I'm something I've mentioned before that I was really excited about is the new Hawkeye series on Disney Plus. Yeah. Now it has been um fantastic for me. I mean, I really like Jeremy Renner's portrayal of Hawkeye. Um, Haley Stanfield does a great job as Kate Bishop. They introduced um, Maya Lopez, who's played by, uh, what's her name? Um, Alakwa Cox, is that how you say her first name? Uh, she's the deaf commander of the tracksuit mafia. But what I think is fascinating to me, and we've talked about this before, about the disconnect between the printed work and the MCU version, mm-hmm. but reading the whole series that this Hawkeye series is somewhat loosely based on it's the series by matt fraction and david aja it's just been so fun watching the little um tidbits that they pull out and watching the character development and knowing hey that's from that show or or, that's from the series i know that the dog lucky or pizza dog or and seeing him there and it's just been so fantastic to me i'm not sure if you've ever read it in the hawkeye series it's the artwork is fantastic. First no, time. but you intrigued me with this pizza dog. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, it's really cool. What's this Go about pizza it. dog? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a dog in the in the um, MCU version that Kate Bishop's character saves from the tracksuit mafia. And the only food that she has in her apartment is a leftover slice of pizza. So she gives it to the dog and okay. he then gets takes a a fondness to pizza similar yeah. to the um comic book series but it's also it's it's um clint barton who finds a dog and rescues him so it's okay. a little you know they do a lot of that actually so in the comic book series it's one character maybe it's um clint and in the mcu it's kate that does it so but it's been really fun really exciting to see where they're pulling it from knowing the the history behind it. And I've been just thoroughly enjoying it. And of course it's set during the holidays. So Christmas in New York city is something that I've always wanted to go do. So just being able to watch it through those eyes as well. And they have um, Rogers, the musical is in the very first episode. So it's like this Steve Rogers musical that, that they create. So it's pretty funny. It's, huh. it's enjoyable. Go watch nice. it. You'll like it. And and so the the you said Maya Lopez right or what was the character's name? Yeah, Echo. So she, I her. yeah, I was going to say so she's Echo, and I think she is going to get her own spinoff, right? From mm-hmm. what I heard, so Next that's year, really yes. cool because she is an indigenous person. Um, she's deaf, so yeah. that's pretty badass. I I actually tried to buy I think her first appearance, and it's so like out of price or like not even oh, wow. easy to find. So I couldn't. I there was no way that I was going to be able to get it uh, without paying out a, a, a pretty penny. Uh, but I, I'm excited that they're continuing to get really cool characters out into, you know, the MCU or Disney plus mm-hmm. universe or whatever, you know, the, the television series, I, I'm still not super excited to sit down and watch Hawkeye. Cause he's not one of my favorite characters. I think you, you officially now more than I do uh, no more than I do about the character. Um, so, but I, I will sit down eventually, I think, and see it and watch it just because it, it, it I'm sure it, it is well done. I like the idea of Kate Bishop. Um, and I, I do want to be able to know like how it's interconnected with the Echo Show because I will for sure be watching that. Um, so I will have to watch it just so that I know what's going on mm-hmm. and not be completely lost. Yeah. And if you get a chance, I highly recommend going to read the series as well. I read through it yeah. all in a couple of days on my, on the Marvel Unlimited app and it's just, it's just wonderful. I, like I said, the artwork. It's not your typical um, comic book artwork. That it, and, you know, every creator has a different style. But yeah. that style, it's more like, um, I think, like 60s noir type of look. You know, mm-hmm. very heavily contrasted colors, a lot of black and whites and reds, especially nice. the covers. And it's it's just so fantastic. I mean, I can't think of a better word. It is. It really is. Yeah. I think I was drawn to the issues, like you said, because of – 
the visuals, but then the, the, the plot is what, you know, the characters is what then keeps me from reading it. Uh, because it, it is, have, you know, it, it's highly regarded as like a great comic series. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm just like, if it doesn't have someone that flies or like shoots lasers or has some sort of superhuman power, I'm just like, uh, it's well, boring. There, there is. So um, I'll just give a little bit. So in the comic book series, Clint and Kate have a big old fight. And Kate that's when Kate moves out west to, to Venice Beach. And she has to um, find her way as like a PI. So a couple of series are from that point of view. And she makes friends over there. And they introduce vampires or what they would call like body replacements in a way so it's <laughs> it's interesting i mean if you want to yeah. get some sort of like more than just human aspect to it so yeah. it's, it's pretty so, cool and i i think that's where it spins out into like the young avengers um with her befriending america chavez who's going to be introduced with dr strange's new movie mm-hmm. which i'm curious to go see the new spider-man movie because i there might be some like you know future foreshadowing about what's mm-hmm. to come I, which i'm really i'm really excited about america chavez like that's one of my favorite characters and she is very much tied into kate bishop and um the young avengers and that whole scene so really excited about that that's this weekend so i can't wait to go yeah, watch it definitely yep anything else that you've been watching well, listening you, to we, you mentioned the golden globe nominations and mm-hmm. that's not something i've been watching you know ardently like following and stuff. Breath. It's just something I happened to, <laughs> to notice. Oh yeah, bated breath. Exactly. <laughs> happened to catch today. And some of the, there's a lot of categories, first of all, my goodness, there's like yeah. the motion picture there and there's a the motion picture, musical and comedy. So they separate the drama from the musical or comedy, which I think is cool in a way um, because it get, uh, gives a chance for both genres to shine Mm-hmm. Because, you know, they really don't mix. And I mean, that's, I guess, the Academy Awards, you know, lumps them all together in one. But yeah. I, I kind of like the separation. But I guess the whole Golden Globe aspect with their, with their controversy of not being very inclusive still, even with um, them trying, I guess. Yeah. But it's, it's I mean, the I, I'll let people go look up the list of nominees so they can decide for themselves whether or not it's it's inclusive enough yeah or to tell if they're trying but i saw that like, my favorite like um andrew garfield for tick tick boom was there like anthony ramos for in the heights two of for like the best performance by an actor in a motion picture musical comedy yeah and then like also um jason sudeikis for ted lasso and so did um, um i know you're you're saying that your your prediction was that lynn manuel miranda was going to get a nom for best director did he get any recognition for his work uh good question let me see if he did or not um this list is so long hold on (laughs) what kind of fanboy of you are of musicals that you don't know if lin-manuel got nominated come on danny (laughs) he's listening to our podcast and he was about to come on and now he's like disappointed now he's crying (laughs) saying danny didn't even pay attention (laughs) <laughs> to no, his he didn't nom. get nominated for for this for the for the Golden Globe, but that's okay. Maybe the yeah. Academy Award um, voters would. Do I a think he'll job. he'll be fine with all his money and accolades yeah, that he's already yeah, received. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think he'll be just thing. fine. I did watch. Sorry to interrupt you there. Yeah, was yeah. Um, so the Ed Asner Center? I guess every year puts on like a table read of "It's a Wonderful Life." Or maybe this was the second year they did it. And it's to raise funds for the Ed Asner Center, which, you know, helps with like um, families with neurodivergent children and to help, you know, mental health. And they promote um, just education for those kids and whatnot. But this year they had um, Jason Sudeikis as the lead role. And they also had Rosario Dawson, Ed Harris, Martin Sheen, and a whole list of people. And it was, I got to watch it and it's just it's fascinating to watch them perform. I don't know if they're doing a cold reading or not of the script, but to watch them in a casual setting in mm-hmm. their homes and just to watch them over a zoom recording to watch them oh, wow. um, do this. And it was really fun. Like Mark Hamill was there as the Clarence, the 
the angel, I guess you would call him. And his yeah. dogs kept barking in the background, just like, you know, what would happen to any one of us? And then um, Lou Diamond Phillips was there and his cat jumped on his lap for like the majority oh, wow. of his time reading. So it was just really fun to watch and really enjoyable. I don't know if you, there's a replay of it anywhere you can catch it, but it's it's really fun. And if you guys go watch it, all proceeds, I guess, support the Ed Asner Center. So it's a worthwhile cause to go watch it. And it's really fun. I enjoyed that a lot. So that's the yeah. other thing I was watching. Yeah, if, if you're a fan of that sort of acting over Zoom, um, you have to see o- Oscar Isaac and Marissa Tomei. They do, um, I think, like a, a reading, I guess, um, online, and it's very steamy. And um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, they, I, I think this came out like maybe a year ago, and it's um, – it's interesting to see two people be able to have that sort of connection as, you know, as actors through mm-hmm. zoom or through, yeah. you know, technology. And, um, it's, it's interesting, you know, people talk about Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper, um, mm-hmm. and were if they were in a relationship, but you see this with Oscar Isaac and Marissa Tomei and you're like, Oh, <laughs> wonder what was oh. going on there. Yeah. So you should check it out. Yeah, uh, just I'll from look, just for the for sake that. of acting, for you to be able to yeah. develop your acting skills. There you go. That, that's it. It's research. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, no, you say that. I mean, it is interesting over a Zoom call. Let's say you never met the other actor or that, yeah. that you're reading with, and to have that instant chemistry, almost like like the same thing I saw when I was watching it with Jason Sudeikis and Rosario Dawson. They play their love interest on that movie, and to see that chemistry between them two of them on there, it's like you know what? I want a full movie just with those two characters and some sort of rom com or something like that. And yeah. it would be fascinating to watch and see that relationship develop into a feature film. Yeah, I I think that one I want to see more Rosario Dawson. Period. Yeah. I think she's so on. <laughs> un- un- um, she doesn't get enough work, I think. Like, I don't see her enough things. Like, she's great. I, I really she love her. She does it all, though. Yeah, I mean, she, she's, she's a singer, busy lady. She's a voiceover actor. She's an, yeah. a regular actor. I mean, I think I saw she's going to be in, like, an uh, actress in a video game coming out called Dying Light 2. Nice. And it's, she's, so they play the motion capture, you know, and she acts in that. So it's, it's really – yeah, you're right. She doesn't get enough work. She's really yeah. needs to be out there more. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is that, like you said, a rom-com, like with the Latina lead, we don't really get to see that a lot. And That's with um, J-Lo, right? Well, I was just going to say with J-Lo, and, but I think um, my dad actually brought this point up is that every – like a lot of the rom-coms that she's in or the roles that, that Jennifer Lopez plays, like they, it's not really portraying a Latina. She's, she's obviously Latina, but with with like – maybe one or two exceptions like she's just playing a woman like it's it's like not necessarily a latina woman so like i would like to see it from the perspective of like um fools rush in with salma hayek and matthew Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. perry Perry. like Mm -hmm. she's obviously a mexican woman in that and they talk about that dynamic that's true um whereas like when i see like what monster in law with jane fonda like you don't really they don't talk about her being latina it's just (laughs) or the wedding planner where she's italian Yeah. So it's like, it's interesting. Like on the one hand, I think it's cool that she like transcends ethnicity to be able to Mm -hmm. play different roles since like white people have done it forever. Uh, But on the other hand, like I would like to see like, I would specifically like to see people of color have more like romantic leads, like it not necessarily necessarily having to be like a white man and a Latino woman. Cause like, Mm -hmm. that's kind of like, a cliche of like you'm saying yeah, like the, mm-hmm. the like spicy love interest it's like this sexy latina like let's have like a romance with like two latino leads like and or like two there is actually one coming out with um god what's his name is it michael p jordan or michael what's his name the actor michael that, p. jordan yeah yeah michael p jordan where he plays like a marine and and it's like a love story i think he dies in it like it's based on a true story oh yes but, i know what you're talking about yeah mm-hmm. yeah it looks sort of sappy and like it's probably gonna make you cry but i i like to i think that it's cool and the fact that it's like we don't when you think about it, we really don't get to see a lot of movies about people of color just being in love like yeah. it, and and it's like it, we're either you know the 
love interest that the, you know the spicy hot latin lover that like the person is cheating with or like the hot sexy latina woman or you know or like the asian the exotic asian woman that's like that the white man's in love with but it's like what about just like a couple that's in love that like they have kids and you know i don't know like love actually like a storyline like that like between people of color it just i don't know you it, when you're talking it reminded me of the the remake of overboard with oh Bob yeah Adam i haven't Harris seen and it Eugenio yeah. oh that's good yeah. yeah you should watch that one that's funny well see that like that's the kind of the thing that it's like it's interesting that i feel that like hollywood they'll say like okay we'll have a latina play that role but then like mm-hmm. to balance it out it has to be a white guy or yeah. we'll flip Boy, it and yeah. we'll have a latino man but then it mm-hmm. has to be a white woman and it's like can we have both like yeah. can we just see like <laughs> my mom and dad or like whoever like something a, a love story that because like it exists like why can't we see two black people in love like and not mm-hmm. you know a single black woman or uh you know a black woman falling in love with whatever i mean it's just it's i would like to see more of that like just kind of talking out loud about things that that would be cool so maybe what well, fingers crossed rosario dawson can have a uh a movie with like oscar isaac or uh what's the other guy his best friend uh uh pascal what's his name pedro 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 pascal, pascal yeah that'd be a good movie yeah right yeah. yeah anything with rosario dawson i'll watch yeah that's cool yeah <laughs> <laughs> why not <laughs> yeah well she's cool i think i didn't wear this hat for nothing it's not just to cover my hair, which is probably very unruly. Um, last week, we talked about our favorite holiday or anti-holiday movies. So yeah. I, we thought about, you know, um, what are some of our favorite holiday songs? Because, you know, Christmas carols, they all – it's an old tradition of going caroling. And it's just, you know, songs really make the season, I think. And I enjoy – some people enjoy listening to Christmas music all the way back in – right at November 1st and yeah. not for me. I mean, the stores enjoy pumping it into our eardrums back then. But I think once December rolls around, especially middle December, like we are right now, um, mm-hmm. I really enjoy the holiday songs because it, you know, it kind of like the hat makes everything a little more festive, makes everything a little more palatable, you know, gets you in that Christmas season spirit and, you know, makes everything a little more bright. So yeah. what just, you know, give us some of your, your favorite jams, your favorite songs, or maybe a song that you really, um, when you hear it, takes you back to like your childhood, maybe. Well, to backtrack, (laughs) I'm one of those people (laughs) that, that doesn't necessarily love Christmas time. Like I sound like such a spoiled brat when I say this, because like I've had, I, I am very fortunate. I'm blessed. I just really am not like a big, christmas person there's nothing wrong with Uh, that and so i along with like the alternative christmas movies i like songs that aren't necessarily like the traditional like Mm -hmm. winter wonderland whatever songs so one of my favorite songs to listen to is oi to the world by no doubt that's probably one that like <laughs> definitely makes me happy it's like mm-hmm. not it's not like the like jingle bell like songs that we all hear it, and mm-hmm. it's it's like a fun song that i would listen to if it wasn't like really about christmas and it's a vandals remake and it's pretty old like i mean especially i mean it's old it's probably like tw- I, i'm afraid to look up how old it is actually uh, i'm gonna guess like it's probably like 25 30 years old maybe um but it's just a fun song. Like I, I'm like a big old school, like no doubt fan. This is before like Gwen Stefani started like dressing like a cowgirl and being with Blake Shelton, and <laughs> she was punk and you know yeah, ska, well, yeah. and mm-hmm. it was just fun. Like I, I love the song. It, it always puts a smile on my face, and it's like one of the ones that like I like when it comes up in like the rotation of Christmas songs. I'm like, hey, there's a song that I like and love that's not Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. I, I'm right there with you to a degree. I mean, I think my Christmas songs that I enjoy are from like the 1950s, 1940s. Mm-hmm. So uh, nothing, I don't really like the more modern songs. Yeah. So like, like my artists that I like are Judy Garland, Frank Sinatra, 
Andy Williams. Um, heck, even Alvin and the Chipmunks, you know, that classic <laughs> cartoon song, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nat King Cole. And I'll even go like the Eagles and the Carpenters, probably like the latest, um, I guess, most modern that I would get into for the songs. Yeah. So, yeah, so if, right you, if you had it. to say like what's like the one that you look forward to hearing because it's like I mean I, in a way we look forward to hearing that song right because you don't listen to it for the whole rest of the year so it's That's like true. okay <laughs> the like first week after Thanksgiving when they start to play Christmas music or holiday music you're like oh I I, find, I get to listen to that song again is there yeah. one in particular uh well I would probably say it's the most wonderful time of the year by Andy Williams. And only reason I say that one is because like Staples did in their famous commercial for going back to school, it can be translated to different things. So like, you know, it's the most wonderful time of the year and then however else the lyrics go. But I, I like that song because it tells the story of, of not just Christmas, but of the whole seasoning season or I guess season happenings around that time, you know, snow falling, getting to, you know, we catch up with people who maybe you haven't talked to in a while in during the season, because that's what people do, I guess. Yeah. Um, they lose track of people for a while and they come back and it's just, you know, having that reconnection with them. So that's probably one of my favorite. I mean, I also like, um, Oh, what's the name of it? One I just heard recently, I think it was last year's it's by a originally by um, the waitresses called Christmas wrapping. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more of an alternative Christmas song. Mm-hmm. And it's really cool. It's really fun. I think the Spice Girls did a remake of it, but it's it's really enjoyable. So those are two I really enjoy. Yeah, I was actually going to mention the waitresses because it's sort of that like New York. I, I don't even know if they're from New York, but I'm going to guess that it's like that downtown New York <laughs> sound. And um, they're probably from like I don't know Denver or some weird like I don't know. But if if I do have to listen to like a Christmas like classic song, like I kind of want it to be like a by like a weirdo like. Frosty the Snowman by Fiona Apple mm-hmm. is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. It's just because it's like it's it's not that old like songs that we've literally heard so many times, but like there still is a bit of nostalgia that you're like, okay, I do want to hear Frosty the Snowman, but like let me hear some weirdo like sing it in their like distinctive vocal <laughs> style. And so Fiona Apple does that for me. I think she she's like another one that's like super underrated. I love yeah. her voice. Um she's amazing um but there's like tons of like if you look up like alternative christmas songs there you Mm -hmm. have like the smashing pumpkins have done christmas music or um (laughs) like just random like weezer has done christmas music like literally everyone i think it's a way for them to make another album for like their Mm -hmm. uh well their fans also contract yeah that too yeah i guess (laughs) i mean sometimes the fans would be like hey put out an album put out the song like like for me, one of my favorite from a band that I like is by The Killers, and it has nothing to do with Christmas per se. It's called um, Joel the Lump of Coal or something like that, and it was created on like, with Jimmy Kimmel uh, for his oh, show. Nice. And it's 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 probably one of the best Christmas songs. I can't believe I didn't mention that. It's probably one of my favorite ones, and I I'll listen to that year round. It's just that good. So yeah, yeah I, I think they have a Christmas album, right? The Killers, like they're another one that's on my list of like alternative bands that have done christmas mm-hmm. music um someone else that like i think is like a a, a new classic is um a couple years ago sia did a christmas album and mm-hmm. the song that I really i love is candy cane lane i don't know if you've ever heard it but it's like super pop like super pop like just like ridiculously pop sounding and okay. just fun and upbeat and like not religious, not it's just like a fun party mm-hmm. song. Like that, I uh, that would be on my mix if like I'm having a Christmas or a holiday party. Like Sia is going to be on there. Like I said, no doubt. Um, the waitresses. Um, I think even RuPaul has like a really cool Christmas song. Uh, nice. that was part of his like Old Navy campaign. Uh, but it's just like anytime that someone does a new take on Christmas music, I kind of tend to go that route. I like I enjoy that. To see That's how cool. someone else can kind of reinterpret the holidays and make it fun. Like it definitely has to be a, a beat for me. Um, mm-hmm. cause I don't like like I, I feel like people are already depressed around the holidays. Like well, yeah, that's very true. That is a yeah, serious season thing, of yeah. depression, right? So like mm-hmm. 
let let's let the music like help us be positive and upbeat versus like sad but if i do have to listen to a slow sad depressing song the the peanuts like that christmas song that one is like for some reason is so like somber and sad for me you know which one i'm talking about like the like it's from the peanuts like the, it's like kind of just like a music uh piano playing Oh, I think uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, you had to. You have to have heard it, yeah, like I'm the pro, Peanuts Christmas song. Sure, I have. Um, I don't know what it's called. I think it's called Christmas Time. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I'm not I'm sure. Lo- I'm looking it up right now. Trying, yeah, I'm trying to look but it up right now. Speaking of like albums, just before we, while we're getting off shoot with that, uh, Nora Jones. Now I love Nora mm-hmm. Jones's voice, and you know, just her the jazzy voice and sultry voice that she has. She released a Christmas album, which she featured the chipmunk Christmas song, I think on it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think that I, was, I, I was just, just listening to that. And I was like doing the, what was the dad's name? Dave? Like, yeah. you know, like, like, Alvin! <laughs> like I, I, we were literally just driving up to LA and we were listening to it. Um, but yeah, she's another cool one. Uh, there's a ton of like Kelly Clarkson has done really cool um uh, christmas music gwen stefani's album is kind of cool um she's done her own christmas album and uh, i'm trying to think of like they're also like do you do you feel like the rent musical is christmas music because i was listening to a dina menzel song and she has seasons of love on that and i that i guess that song is mm. good for christmas or the holidays I don't because it talks about like love and how you're measuring your, you know. Yeah, but I mean, if I was going to put it attached to any holiday, it'd be more Valentine's, I think. Not not really Christmas, at least for me. Yeah. I mean, it, or even like New Year's, where you're like recounting, you know, what you have for the year. You know. Yeah. What makes I, up I think year. it's true that it's probably more New Year's, but like Christmas, New Year's, like the holidays. I think that's like one thing, right? Yeah, especially guess, for people yeah. that aren't like religious it's like christmas the new year's and that like that whole party time like when you're visiting friends and family and mm-hmm. it just sort of blends together and and then before you know it it's a new year and everything's yeah. done with but <laughs> and then it's just cold bleak winter yeah exactly yeah. well not in <laughs> not, not in california <laughs> <laughs> true true yeah it is kind of cold here right now but never snowing or bleak i guess <laughs> okay I think. yeah um the last song i'll mention oh a couple of them i mean just could give a nod to our hispanic roots uh jose feliciano's feliz navidad i think is a uh-huh. classic um christmas song that is sung and even the, um bing crosby's melikaliki laka is that what it is yeah uh, yeah it's something like that that one and then um john lennon's happy christmas the war is over that's like a classic one for me I yeah think. i i do like that i think yoko ono almost ruins that song for me <laughs> uh, <laughs> um but i and i do hate the jose feliciano song like i think it's so cheesy and corny it is uh, it is cheesy and corny but it's a classic yeah it is a classic i just i hate it i don't know um <laughs> <laughs> but um one of the ones that, that like i used to always look forward to do you remember the very special christmas albums that they used to put mm-hmm. out it was like mm-hmm. for i think it's like amphar or like an aids organization and they always had like modern artists and their take on christmas yeah. music and then i think that modern artists started to see like how profitable it was to make christmas albums so then they just started making christmas albums but one of the ones on there was like that always kind of makes me laugh because it's so bad but in it good way i guess is santa baby by madonna because the accent that she puts on is so horrible and it just it's funny it's like it's it's fun to listen to but at the same time like it's kind of it's like the song that like i love to hate or hate to love Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it's so bad it is if i have to hear a version of that like you have to listen to eartha kit sing it like that's that's the classic yeah i agree yeah I agree. Well, I hope this makes everyone want to go out and sing their favorite Christmas song. Yeah. Put on a Christmas hat like Danny and go sing your little heart out. (laughs) (laughs) We won't judge you. Just do it. Record it. Share it with us so we can have a good laugh with you. Yeah. 
Not at you, with you. No, for sure. Not at you, not with you. <laughs> yeah, never, never at people. <laughs> no, never, never. Yeah. Right? I mean, I think I've been laughed with my whole life. Right? With- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that that is like the uh, all of the Christmas song talk that we have for for this exactly. week. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, any other things that you're looking forward to for our next like movies that are coming? Obviously, we touched upon Spider Man that comes out this weekend, so I'm definitely going to obviously talk about that. Um, the following week, The Matrix Resurrection comes out. Oh, that's right. I'm looking forward to that a lot, especially just seeing all the marketing that's going on for it right now. It's just getting me really psyched about watching it. Psyched. I, I wow. definitely have to go back and rewatch it because mm-hmm. I, I obviously like I, I've watched them all. I kind of have a general idea of what's going on, but like I don't know how there wasn't a happy ending. Like, was there an ending? Like, I don't even remember at this point. Like, obviously, right. like now they're starting off where he's like in the matrix and he doesn't know what's going on or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And well, the, um, yeah, um, Keanu Reeves did an interview with Graham Norton and um, he was like, Graham Norton was like, how are you in this? Aren't, isn't your character dead? And Keanu Reeves is like, that's what I thought. <laughs> or <something like> that. <laughs> but then he, he shared a conversation he had with, um, is it Lisa Wachowski? I think that's Lisa, right? Oh, the, the director. Yeah. Lana, I think. Lana, Lana thank you. Sorry, yeah. Lisa Lana. Um, and she said to Keanu Reeves, is he, is he dead? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, just to how they created and brought up this about. But, yeah, I know part one of The Matrix really well. Yeah. Part two and part three, I'll need to revisit because, you know, those weren't – didn't stick in my head as much, I guess. But before yeah. it comes out, I need to pay those a visit. I feel like I probably watched the first one at least 20 times. So like I know I get the plot down pretty good. Mm-hmm. And then the second and third one I probably saw once. Yeah, same here. So mm-hmm. so I definitely have to go back. The thing that's interesting is that I guess it's supposed to be like a metaphor for trans people, which I, I didn't I don't mm-hmm. see thinking back. I can't recall how that's how that's a thing. Um, and so I'm curious to go back and watch it and see how that possibly could be you know, the, the directors are, are trans women. And so like that, they're saying that they wrote and, and directed it as a metaphor for their trans experience or their, um, journey. And Mm -hmm. so I'm kind of, cause I, obviously I, I didn't catch that the first go round. So, um, I'm kind of curious to kind of see that with that knowledge and seeing if I can kind of pick up on what they were putting down in regards to that. Um, cause I, I don't see the connection, uh, outside of like, I guess you are living one type of life and then you wake up and you're living, uh, your the true reality, I guess. So like, I get oh, that, true. but yeah. Okay. So, um, mm-hmm. I'm interested in that. Uh, I am interested in seeing like what they're going to do with the characters because, you know, I, I did like the movies very much. So, so um, that is something I'm going to be looking forward to as well. Um, just like you say, stated. So there's that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any, anything else? I, I'm trying to think of any um, other. The other movie. thing, uh, book of Boba Fett on Disney plus I'm looking forward to. I think it's coming okay. out at the end of the month. Nice. Um, so if, as I've said before, it, it follows the story of Boba Fett, you know, the classic bounty hunter in the star Wars, um, world or universe so i'm really looking forward to how that's going to play out a really good i think that this is just like a marketing thing that i just came up with they should make boba tea with and promote boba fett so it'd be boba fett boba i think that'd be really good (laughs) disney can write me a check now and and start doing that exactly (laughs) boba boba you want a boba with your boba fett yeah okay yeah I, I, I mean, because I when I was at the movie theater, they had a really cool um, Ghostbuster, Ghostbusters, what's their mobile, or whatever it is. Yeah, for like a popcorn. It's like the, oh, okay. the vehicle and they had it as a pie. And it was really cool. I don't know how much it was because I wasn't going to buy it. But uh, it was kind of interesting cross promotion of like buy a, a popcorn container and it's a cool like memorabilia. See? You're talking about movie promotion and, and theaters and stuff. And that when I was back in the day, uh, manager at a movie theater, 
part of my um, job was the promotions. So I really got excited for that because like I did like when this is the Matthew um, Broderick's Godzilla version came out. I got a yeah. reptile store to bring a bunch of um, lizards and stuff because Godzilla oh, wow. at that time was more, you know, trying to treat him as just a lizard, not a monster. So yeah. um, then – one that I really miss out on doing because I was shot down by the corporate office of the movie theater saying that, oh, that movie's going to be a flop. You don't do that. I wanted to get a local four piece orchestra, a well, four piece um, quartet to come in and play in the lobby when Titanic was released. So that's really dating me there. But I, and you know, make it have people dressed up in like, you know, bow ties, you know, elevated a little bit. And yeah. oh, they said, oh, that movie's gonna bomb. Of course, it didn't. Oh wow, one of the highest grossing movies ever. So it's, I wish that's something I wish I could have done. That would have been very yeah. fun. It would have been cool if, like, when the boat hits the iceberg, if you would have had a hose and sprayed the audience <laughs> down with cold water. The whole 4D type thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just have or, it flood the theater and just have it rising as the movie goes along. <laughs> tell, like, one of your, your employees, like, I'm going to hand you some ice and go throw it at people in the audience. And, like, the little teenage kid that you have is like, I don't think that's going to be allowed, sir. Just do as I say. <laughs> do as I say. Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> I actually no. – I had a really cool in-store promotion when I – and I worked at Blockbuster Music. We had um, the Goo Goo Dolls come and play at, oh, nice. the, at our store. Mm -hmm. And their manager gave me tickets to go see the concert. And it was Bush headlining the Goo Goo Dolls and No Doubt. And then oh, wow. they gave me backstage passes and I was able oh, to wow. meet everyone. And that's how I like – met Gwen Stefani and the guys and became like super fan of no doubt. Cause they were super cool and uh, really chill. And this is like their very first album before, like she started dating Gavin before, like they really kind of ascended into stardom. And so um, that was really cool. So I kind of missed those fun events working at like retail or, you know, kind of doing those cool, you know, creative yeah. stuff. Cause uh, yeah. obviously like a corporate, environment we don't really get to do stuff like that so mm -hmm. that was a fun time good yeah, old 95 right. good old 95 <laughs> exactly <laughs> 95 through 97 you know our heydays yeah yeah i feel like do you remember and well, i think his name was andy rooney and he was on 60 minutes he mm -hmm. was like the cranky old man and he was like mm -hmm. why is it that kids these days <laughs> <laughs> i like completely feel like that nowadays i'm like why is it that these millennials <laughs> he had like the world's most annoying voice Mm -hmm. It was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, so yeah. that's who we are now. Yes. <laughs> well, on that note, I think we've come to an end of this week's podcast. I would agree. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Remember to subscribe so that you can uh, get notifications of our new episodes. We post every week on Wednesdays um, so you can get a fresh dose of Danny and myself talking about pop culture and all the you know cool stuff that's happening in the world. Um, so please subscribe, comment, uh, you know, talk about us, talk to us, leave comments, tweet us, Instagram Laugh us, whatever. Us. Yeah, slide into our Laugh DMs if you want. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, take take care. Um, have a safe weekend wear your mask be safe we'll see you next week bye everybody bye <laughs>